afternoon, everybody. My name is Andrew Kripp. I am the architect of the Estonian Information System. And yes, that's a very fancy title, but actually it means very little because, uh, you know, the actual handiwork is to execute at the associate agency of the services. But today I'm going to do what I still generally do, which is talk about things. Um, I'm talking about even this made emphasis in the call today. Um, but before we go there, um, to get into actual details, let's talk about the show. This is a slide deck that I've used actually on almost every presentation I've had to foreigners, just to illustrate the story. Um, the important number is this number. The data source I took the information from, I think it was World Bank, might be mistaken, actually rounds the population of countries to the nearest million. In case of Estonia, this means that a quarter of our population is just rounding girls. That's how small we are. Um, and we can see that our, we are like on par roughly with uh, Latvian and Russian population way back in terms of, in terms of G GNI from US and Singapore. What's even more important is this figure. Um, this shows us the um, trend of the GNI per capita. And you know, it's only that you know, Russian Federation, we are sort of back here. Sometimes we are ahead, sometimes that and sometimes Russians doesn't matter. Difference is not that much. Cross cross national income. Basically, GDP, that's like why it's different, it doesn't really matter. It means how rich we are or how poor we are. And the point of this picture is that although we get richer, these quarters get richer. Still, we're growing about the same, at the same, same pace. And even if we manage somehow to actually replicate the miracle of, of Singapore, where they actually grew much faster than everybody else, it would still take. 10, 15, 20 years to catch up to the US and Singapore and South Korea and these people. This means that for the foreseeable future, we are, as the polite saying goes, uh, resource constrained, which in Estonia just means poor. Uh, and that's how things are. So, how can we even possibly afford a country being so poor? And please remember that in these parts we need a really well functioning country because if we leave a gap anywhere, um, there's a chance that it's, uh, it's going to be used in, in some way or form. And you already know the answer. We go we go papers. We have less bureaucrats, we have less uh, um, papers being pushed around. And we also lack the um, deep group of bureaucracy, creating more bureaucracy, creating more bureaucracy. And at that point, at several conferences, somebody has gone, oh, but we know those, we need those programmers instead of bureaucrats now. And is, aren't those servers horribly expensive? And is there really a saving in this fancy garment? Well, yes. We are seeing use cases where a single adding a single feed to a single service on XRO, which is our integration bus, effectively has a return on investment of six years. Not for that field, but the entire XRO infrastructure. Adding one field pays for the entire thing in five or six years, depending on how we do the math. Uh, Estonia spends and People have made that number of order of magnitude is still, still right. It still spends two orders of magnitude less for IT than people. And for those not that familiar with the geography of the region, we are not two orders of magnitude smaller, uh, either by area, either by order of population. So it actually really sort of saves money, money that can be spent elsewhere. 
the more <coughs> one other important number on the first slide is this. In 2013, apparently there was that many people in the so Estonian workforce. And God forbid this one guy so braced hard or something. And then to sincerely hope that maybe he's doing well, otherwise they've done this one thing. Um, what this number basically means is that our our prime minister to citizen ratio is too high. We still need one prime minister. Seven hundred thousand people or seven million people. There's this there's still gonna be prime minister and government and parliament. You know, I want to set up 24 7 monitoring, is, is, you need at least four people. It doesn't really matter whether the thing you're monitoring is that large or that large or that large, you still need four people. Which means in Estonia our overhead is very, very large. Our fixed costs are relatively high compared to the variable cost if we consider this, uh, the variation in the population growth. <coughs> so, what can we do about it? You are familiar with the Estonian psyche and the general being and the democratic, democratic demographic trends in Estonia, uh, then you will realize that forcing Estonians to uh, have more children, that's not really an option. Also, inviting lots of different people over here is really not an option either, because quite frankly, who the hell would actually want to live here? One of the badgers and squirrels. And basically, let's face it, Finland is right there. If somebody has any said, okay, that's all I'm going to be, I'm willing to tolerate the cold, it's much, much more likely that they end, they end up in Finland or Sweden, where the planet is the same and the Europe is much, much better. So, what can we do about this? And the answer is government as a service. That's, what, that's basically what our concept of concept of um, digital irresidency is about. Has anybody read the news about the irresidency? Anybody know, everybody knows what it is. Generally people if you know not yet. Yeah. In that case I must actually ask them, no, ask you guys some questions afterwards because I I, I don't have a full understanding of what the hell it is and what it is. Um, fully. But on the sort of outside what it, what it means is that we will be handing out um light cards effectively um, to anybody. I was at a, at a seminar with with very well educated European so researchers and policy makers. And I gave roughly the same presentation telling them, yeah, you know, we're gonna give out electronic ID cards. And yes, we will have this ambition of giving about 10 million of those. And people want them. Wait a minute, they just have 1 million people. Yes, but we need to give them all to everyone. What do you mean? Like, me? Yes, of course. That, that concept is so alien. That idea that the country sort of pushes its founders to that extent is completely alien to everyone. It's so ready. And I think it illustrates very neatly the position we're in. I'm the irresident skeptic. I'm one of the more, more skeptical people around the residents. But I don't see really many other options. We are so tiny, we're so small that we need to innovate around what a country should eat in order to actually remain a country. Very simply, it's a question of survival. And the alternatives, not playing around with the residents and other things, that those, are, those options are not much better. However, e residence is something that is, yes, we need to sort of go and meddle with the, with the personal ID code of Estonians and we need to do all those things, but that's not really interesting. What is interesting is that all of this dependence on these services means that this will continue to become a problem. 
And that's, that's where the pole team starts to come in. You see, we can't switch back to paper. First, obviously, because we, for the same reasons, we actually went to Egypt in the first place. Um, but also, we know we no longer have power. I didn't really realize this, that I've been working at this position for, for a year. And the more I learned about our information systems, and business processes, and so on and so forth, I realized that there's absolutely no way back. Um, there, first, there are, not people, there are not enough people to actually process the papers physically. And secondly, the skill of managing mountains of paper has been lost in the past year. Because it's simply it's not necessary. It's not needed. Therefore, that skill is lost. And therefore, you know, we, we don't know how to manage papers. And the other thing is that digital is built very, very, very deep. That's again where we differ massively from the rest of the Europe. The rest of the Europe takes their age-old process of doing something and then goes, oh, but we can send this paper over the internet. And they send those papers over the internet and automate the same silly process, converting it into very automated, very efficient silliness. Uh, but it's still kind of silly, pushing the paper on. Finns and Estonians, um, actually the Finns are only, only guys who actually do it uh, in the same way. We actually redesigned that the business processes around it, meaning that we, we designed the processes from ground up to be electronic. And this is not because Estonia is some sort of magical internet Narnia where everybody's like, just loves the internet. No, it's simply because we have the luxury of not having any legacy. And we have the luxury of, of, of designing the process like so. But still, the fact remains, we cannot go back. These processes we have built around our each services, they no longer scale on paper. We can't actually make them work on paper. What this means is that really, the, as I said, we did. This will continue to be really, 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 really a problem. So what can we do about this? Well, if you want to have a tier one data center, actually, if you want to have two tier one data centers, uh, you need to place them 250 kilometers apart. As far as I know. There is not. You can't. You can't actually do that. Well, you can, but then one of them ends up either on the islands or close to a certain border. Neither of which is a really good idea. So, from one hand, we have this digital continuity problem, and from the other, we actually physically cannot build a proper data center infrastructure. And by the way, one of the points that those data centers need to be placed at that is in support of this is that they belong to different sort of uh, supplies, the supply areas from the perspective of, of the power grid. In Estonia, if, if there's a massive accident in, uh, in, a, in a certain uh, state, power station in northeastern Estonia, this entire Estonia is going to be dark. And it's just, it's just going to be dark. But because of both of the data centers are going to be dark. So, what can we do? Let's move to the cloud. And now this, this is where our my lengthy introduction actually turns into the actual presentation. <clears throat> because we have thought about these things long and hard, and the thinking has materialized in the concept that is called uh, data embassy. And we have run into, into several issues and challenges, and we're doing so. Those issues and challenges are the actual meat point of my presentation today. Um, First thing is I want to talk about is this uh, Estonian infrastructure, or this this is actually the my subject of my work. This is the Estonian information system architecture. We have an agent system. We have the layers. We have infrastructure layer, operation layer that is the X-Road, delivery channels, electronic ID, 
And what happens if you want to, if we want to move this thing to a cloud, uh, which means in this diagram, which means that part of that infrastructure, that chunk here, is going to be deployed separate. Let's say in our, in our let's say, Beijing embassy, not really, but let's say Swedish embassy. What happens is that, all oh, right, everybody goes, yeah, we have fairly high, the studies show that we have fairly high virtualization rates, fairly large number of Estonian government type right, servers, so the servers are actually virtualized. So let's take that. This image is just deployed in a, in a, in a machine in, a, in an embassy and in Anguille. We have the state embassy on the Anguille. Um, the future uh, question arises what about the network? What about network configuration? So what nodes does that node actually need to see? And why? What nodes must be hidden? How, how, how does the network look like? All right, so now we need to start replicating network settings as well. And oh darn, yes, your, your service kind of depends on the X row, asking questions from different registries. So does your service actually survive being cut off from the extra row? Because that kind of depends on the other registers and those. Those other registers might be still in the stone. So how do you do that? Deliver exception. Now that the, that's where things get really interesting. Um, if you think about a problem of DNS that for the vast majority of the time, your service must resolve to make the address in Estonia. But at a click of the switch, you must be able to actually switch it over to point to a different main server. What is it? <coughs> it is really a non-trivial problem if you think about it properly, because you will find out that a lot of the DNS servers Estonia depend upon are not actually in Estonia. So if Estonia is, for example, cut off from the rest of the world, you will, you will create an interesting situations where half of the world must resolve to the New data embassy IP, and the, but the Estonian still needing the service must still be able to access the local version. And then you get the issue of, of actually merging those back, back later. And the question becomes really obvious. And of course, electronic ID, our certification center is, is very nice, but it's located in Estonia. If we have a service that is only accessible via your ID card, can't verify your certificate or location list because the plastic listing is easy in Estonia, then, well, yeah, well. The point is that the cloud is not simply an infrastructure problem. It's simply so Very, very rapidly, you get into, all right, so infrastructure, we have deployed, you get into network, you get into integration, you get into um, delivery channels issues, and it comes very rapidly also see that stack, that, that cutting off, actually continues upwards, and you need to be able to cut off the business processes as well. By the way, um, data embassy or virtualization of the country, we have actually done before. In 1940, that's exactly what happened. However, that was 1940, now it's 2014. Is it really possible to cut off a business process in a way that is actually independent and basically outside of is it? I don't know. I'm not special. Some processes probably can, but no, I don't know. So, uh, the question about the cloud becomes a um, sort of very, very complex pro problem uh, for everybody in an organization. And it turns out that um, in the cloud, it's relatively straightforward. The previous presentation described us that you can actually do that. Everybody does it. Transfer wise does that all the time. Being outside of the cloud is also very doable, but everybody knows how to do that. But actually shifting between those paradigms, that's where things require a really high level of maturity from everybody in the organization. I'm not entirely sure at all that the agencies actually have the maturity. That's a challenge for us. The next issue that we have is the question of trust. Can you trust them? Uh, the next couple of slides I can almost skip because the point was very nicely, very neat, illustrated by our friends at Microsoft. 
yesterday. Anybody know what happened to Azor yesterday? There was an outage. Nine hours of an outage. Global outage. Let's, let's imagine we have we had to wait Estonia into Azor. Nine hours, no country. Oops. For business, yeah, you lose, you lose business, but you can always hopefully somehow have Azure or Microsoft pay you for that. And Microsoft is keeping up pockets that they actually will. Uh, with a country, there's this thing. We have this uh, thing that's called uh, electronic uh, government. Well, basically, it's an electronic body of laws. And we have basically got a read of the paper version. That means that if that registry is down, there is no legal law in Estonia. Not simply just because there is no way to verify whether some action is legal or not. For nine hours, I am not entirely sure that the implications of that would be very nice. And the thing is that small cloud players are too small. Yeah. So you give your servers to some cloud provider and they go bankrupt the next day or pile up or decide to get out of the business. Then what? Yes, you can sue the damages. Yes, but what about the country? Will they be able to give up the collateral? Then there's this awkward issue of you having Let's say, let's take a company A in Estonia, and let's, let's say we, we give all of our servers to host, hosted by that company. And you know, within a couple of weeks, we find out that the current company, that current company is bought out by the current company of a guy that is friends with uh, the owners of Castro. Oops. Our risks simply increased. Like that, without, and that's beyond completely beyond our control because the owners of that company are very welcome to business with whomever they wish. The big players, however, are to be. We go and tell Michael, I still love to have this 200 virtual servers, please. And we'd also like to dictate to the conditions under which you will provide us the service. That's, that's not how it works. That's not how any of it works. Uh, yes, they are interested in us, but they are only interested in us because our thinking can be used to actually sell their services to bigger governments. That's it. We have absolutely zero leverage against Microsoft or Amazon or whoever. And they can decide to get out of that business that there's this uh, race in the bottom in storage rooms. Might happen in the cloud. All of these things can happen. And by the way, what about your credit change? Let's say we have friends. Let's say we are friends with uh, I don't know, Botswana. And we store our servers and our data in Botswana because we are friends with the government of Botswana. And then there's a completely utterly democratic process through which the citizens of Botswana decide that their government has the absolute right to look into all data under their jurisdiction. And they will do that. So, what is Estonia to do then? That, I, I mean, we might think this is wrong, but the people of Botswana have spoken. And they have the right to do that. And the company must actually comply with those laws. And by the way, in, with great multinational companies, it is not really entirely clear what is the jurisdiction they fall under. It's not clear at all who has actually the right to actually claim certain servers. And, you know, what this all comes down to is this. This is from an awesome movie, uh, Ronin. That's Robert De Niro. There's a great quote from, uh, from the guy here. Lady, I never walk into a place I don't know how to walk out of. You better have a place, 
kind of place? Or what happens if your cloud provider pays your trust? Because they can do it instantly. You need to have a backup. You need to be able to get out of the party. You need to know how to walk out of that place. Because in the end, no one can trust you. That's, that, that's a simple step. Not with very important. Yes, it's always a question of what is your risk profile and, and what kind of data you're storing and, and what, what business are you in. But with really important stuff, you simply cannot trust anybody, not if you're a soldier. You remember that slide. It's more like underneath. So, what can we do? And the answer is cryptography. Uh, there's something that's called secure multi-party computation, which is a really awesome concept. What this allows you to do is it allows, allows you to share data uh, between parties and perform computation on top of that data in a fashion that uh, the, the parties actually don't know, don't, can't, can't access your data. Let's take an example. Let's say you have uh, US and you have China. Both of them have, have, have satellites in orbit, right? Both of them are interested in not colliding with satellites. They're having the having satellites not collide. But neither is willing to trust the other party with the exact coordinates of their satellites, right? So in, in the context of <coughs> Secure multi part computation, what you can do is you can submit the both trajectories of the uh, of, of US and China between three parties and, uh, and ask questions from that cluster about the tra trajectories. And either and it is mathematically provable that provable that you cannot deduct the trajectories of the satellites from the answers that you get. And none of the parties actually can compile the trajectory. Very straightforward, very simple. Um, let's try to illustrate. And by the way, all of my knowledge of this awesome technology is based on these people. Share my view. It's a certain star company, and they have actually figured out how to do this and how to make it scale. And uh, basically, this is how it works. Of course, there's a lot more math behind it, but that's the basic. basic. Let's take two numbers 12 and 8, and their averages. Now let's split both of those numbers in between three nodes. One, four, and seven, and three, two, and three. And now you can ask you node know, one for the average of these numbers. You get two, you node know, two, you get three, you node know, three, you get five. You add those, those numbers up, you get ten. You node know, one, you node know, two, and node three have no understanding of what the actual original numbers were. And I have no way of knowing what the original was either. I just get the average result. That's how that's basically how it works. Of course, there's a ton of need to read the um, both computer science, engineering, and mathematics behind it to actually make it work. But this is one of the technologies that we are looking into in order to make the uh, data and see work. But it was from the by chairman. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the beauty of it. It's cryptography. Cosmon can buy uh, can buy share mine, but when that happens, we still have the source code is still open. We still know what's the, what's what goes on underneath, and we still know the algorithm by which the numbers split. What what happens if a Russian scientist figures figured out how to actually reverse engineer that thing. That's a different story. But uh, based on our current understanding of the map, that's not necessarily possible unless there are any limitation mistakes on So that, that's one of the things we are, we are trying to do. And you can see how this can be applied. You can do different so you can split the encryption process itself between parties, you can split the keys, you can split so encrypt backups, you can split 
the entire application between different parties and have a UI actually ask questions of it. You can do all of those different things that are looking into it, using that technology. Second thing um, that, or the second way we use cryptography in is browser based cryptography. Basic logic behind the scenes that since nobody can be trusted, not a single byte of unencrypted information can move through an unencrypted device or an untrusted device. Effectively, the only leading end user workstation has been to an extent trusted. Um, effectively, this sort of brings us back full circle to the uh, time of bad clients. With the difference that now we have quite a vehicle, we can we can deploy those those clients via the web, and uh, we can use them in a unified way in the browser. We need to build different applications in different platforms. And in theory, it is doable. It is doable. People run all sorts of funky things in, uh, in JavaScript nowadays. The JavaScript world has has taken great strides. However, there are still challenges. Um, Firstly, the standardization is still simply not there. The web crypto API is coming to age, it is starting to gain traction, but it's clearly that it lacks certain functions that we actually need. For example, it doesn't provide an API to actually interact with the token device that's like the chip card. Can't actually, that is simply not there. Also, uh, big players are really reluctant to cooperate on the browser and OS issue. Anybody here use Macros Yosemite? Anybody try to use the iCard software on it? Yeah, well, didn't work. Um, and Estonia was not the only country who had it, was impacted. The US Department of Defense was weeks and weeks and weeks after uh, Yosemite came out, they still hadn't done their software to work and they have finally taken cards out. So uh, we have that challenge. And also there are certain interesting computer science issues. For example, so let's let's say we encrypt everything and we, we send it to the server in, encrypt, in, in an encrypted format. How do you do search? You want to do search over all documents don't, they don't want to pull the index out to the client to the search there, it's too expensive, but the data is encrypted, so how do you solve that? Yes, we can extract the, the keywords and then do search based on those, but then we review the keywords to the cloud. Can we actually do that? Certain data, yes. With some other data, no. How do you, how do you actually solve that? Uh, and then there's key management. Let's say I have encrypted all of my documents with my awesome ID card, I carry with me everywhere, and then I lose it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't I don't have a good solution of how to actually do that. Maybe surrogate keys where which you can access while with your ID card or an application or but then again you need to have a place where the surrogate keys surrogate keys are kept, and well, what if that gets compromised? Lots of different but difficult questions. But my goal today is not to uh, provide an answer. I didn't say that in any, <laughs> in any point in presentation that I'm going to tell you how we're going to do the uh, I only told you that I'm going to talk about challenges that we have to face. Challenges that most likely are challenges that are being faced by any organization trying to well. So let's draw some conclusions. What can we make of it all? Firstly, as I said, moving to cloud assumes a high level of maturity of the organization, actually much more than either being out or being in. Shifting between those paradigms is really complex. And it assumes that the entire organization from the business to the system administrator can actually relate and is willing to cooperate and is willing to think and change. That's really its own role. Trust decisions need to get in. 
we make a lot of assumptions about what can be trusted. How, how much do you trust your CPU? Do you really trust your CPU? Ends up if you trust the CPU in your lab. Why is that? That bloody thing contains billions of transistors, and it only takes like two or three modifications of those transistors to actually alter the behavior in a way that would be A, disastrous, and B, completely unpredictable. Why? Why do you trust, trust the CPU? Do you trust your network interface Do you trust your operating system? Do you trust the C? You make a lot of implicit trust issues every single day. However, if you go to cloud, you absolutely must ask those questions explicitly. Same question, explicitly. Um, because on the cloud, lots of questions arise like that. Lots of questions about trust. Um, cryptography seems to be the solution. Like alcohol. Technically, alcohol is a solution. And cryptography seems to be a way to actually approach this. And with, like with ShareMind, we have some ideas of how to do that. However, it is not entirely clear. We're trying to do stuff that is not, not sort of fully there at all. There are the, the initiatives to actually how to, how to build really, really secure um, government power is still just stringed up. Uh, Germans driving a driving initiative, we're trying to uh, be, be partners of the US is doing their own thing. So we really are really on cutting edge and really there are advances. However, if you are a business and if you even have the function of risk management somewhere in that organization, and eventually you will, uh, then the questions we are asking ourselves now are the questions we will be asking ourselves in the future regarding the cloud. The answers might be different, but the questions might be the best. Uh, will be the same. Mm -hmm. 
again, I don't have an answer to that. We are thinking about this, maybe. Yeah. Um, and uh, the second and third time together, uh, it's not going to be this day, thank you. Uh, when you are saying that, that you, there are piece by piece, everything you cannot uh, trust. Basically. You cannot trust uh, the server rooms, uh, by the clouds, uh, and so forth. And then there's the idea that uh, let's use the, the space of our embassies, physical embassies in other countries. Uh, let's say this is our land in Japan or whatever. But if you cannot uh, trust the land there anymore, because you know, things change, uh, Japanese are not uh, our friends anymore. That's it. It might happen. So, uh, wouldn't it be actually making a place that, that you, there wouldn't be any chain where you actually have certain things that you can trust without any risk? Well, it's always a question about risk management. It's always a question about how much are we willing to spend theoretically on certain risk and how, how, what is the impact of that risk materialized. So there's always that risk management, and I don't know. It is a question of for all the people to assess the risk. But for the, for the, uh, so I don't know what what can we trust and to what extent. Fundamentally, everything can be challenged. That there is a, it, fundamentally it can all trust can be challenged. For example, this chairman. Let's assume you all set up three nodes. They are physically separated locations. That's fine. One of they uh, them are now out. You don't have it anymore. So what will you do then? Then you will say that oh, we need to have some backup. So the data that was in the third node, not now gone, should be somewhere else as well. So yep. still, uh, and, and then you, the problem rises and rises. So it, it would be really interesting to see how you solve that actually. Um, with encryption. And the, the point of sharing right, is that, and by the way, with the services data moved to our physical embassies, we still assume that that's hosted by ground. Stuff there is always encrypted. Uh, but with Chiramine, that's, that's the awesome part. You can actually split it up in so multiple ways that even if one node is compromised, you can still reveal the data. And compromising that one node means nothing about the entire of the data. But, but anyway, it's, it's a very interesting topic that uh, to see how you actually saw that. So, just... yeah, sure so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, we, we are actually. Yeah, uh, that's a tricky one. Uh, 
uh, I'll ask you the way that uh, if you reply and uh, you can't reply, you will be uh, more silent in silence for more than one or two seconds than I'm telling you. That, that's the end. So my question is that uh, have you been approached by NSA and that, that kind of security guard? Security interest areas, uh, because uh, as one of the speculation for this air residency is that is the point point cryptography uh, use. That is not the sort of good thing for for uh, you know big eyes. Um, of course, all sorts of agencies immediately. But the, the news started leaking that our people were in US and they, they were approached immediately by all sorts of agencies. Uh, the main concern was about taxes and the same thing. The taxes was the first especially because now there's a big fear that all sorts of up time, know your customer and other rules that are being proposed that are actually protecting German, US, France, so the taxpayers. That their, their fear was that Estonia is going to become a tax haven, basically. We tried not to do that. We tried to even avoid communicating about that. And that sort of illustrates the entire interest, um, interest towards the residents. Of course, there's immediate interest from all sorts of different parties. But think of it like telecoms in Skype. To this day, telecoms and telecom regulators have no idea what Skype means and how to regulate that. There's a wide different sort of setups and how to, how, how, how to think about that. New residence is kind of like that. It's completely different. It's like it's out there, it's, it's awkward, it doesn't really shift paradigm. No, there's a difference that Skype is a co co corporate company. You go there, you agree that there's a backdoor. But with the government, you go there, you agree there's a backdoor. Um, I think we did But anyway, I agree that, that there's, even around this, there's a business case, definitely. A lot of people are looking for a point to point uh, photography on the cards. Uh, and uh, when you lost the card, it's then closed. You cannot open the documents anymore. So I support it, but it will, maybe it will not be exactly on the services that are providing some other things. I just, I don't know. The, that's the thing about integration. You really never know how it's going to be picked up or what it's going to be used. And that's one of the risks we have actually identified is that the first thing it's uh, picked up for is all sorts of shady activities, and we for some reason, might lack the ability to actually shut those down in time. In, in which case, we'll be sort of this, we'll get sort of the status of Delaware. And, uh, well, imagine not being able to rent a car anywhere in the world because you're from Estonia and the Estonian is fundamentally cannot be trusted. That would be bad, right? We, we try to avoid that. And that's one of the reasons. Now, we all might make the question, 